Hi everyone, this is Maggie Ostara and I'm delighted to welcome you to the first in a series of um, teachings about resiliency by design. And this is nestled inside of the larger topic that I have been um, working on really for about 15 years, which is sovereignty and sovereignty now by human design. And I think that these, um, these topics reside really well inside of human design. And so I was um, really motivated and inspired by uh, what's happening in our world right now to be sharing some insights from human design that I think can be really helpful for getting through this time and actually is part of our soul curriculum as really part of our evolutionary path. So it's not just specific to making our way <laughs> through um, COVID-19 um, pandemic, um, but it is, um, it is uh, relevant to this time and will be more broadly available, um, uh, you know, re um, applicable um, through our lives. Okay, great. So hi, um, from those of you who are tuning in, go ahead. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Paige. Go ahead. And I know there's a bunch more of you who are here on. So if you're willing to come on and say hi, that's always great. So I want to, um, and those of you who are on um, Facebook Live, you know, go ahead, same thing, you know, post in the um, comments below, um, say hello post any questions that you have. Um, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to manage this between questions that are happening on uh, Zoom and then on Facebook Live, so I'll do my best. <laughs> so I'm just gonna ask for your, your patience um, as I'm getting um, used to doing this. I usually just do things on Zoom and it's pretty straightforward and uh, haven't done a lot on Facebook Live. Um, so I wanna start out, oh good, hi Beatrice, hi Shan, um, hi Lee. And hi to all of you on Facebook Live who are watching now, and the replay um, that'll be uh, that'll that'll be up after this is over. I want to start out by just saying a few things about uh, my approach to human design. I want to just give a nod to my teacher and mentor, um, Karen Curry Parker. She is the person I decided to train with once I decided that I wanted to become a specialist in human design. <coughs> Excuse me. I had been studying myself um, on my own, reading books, listening to um, recordings, um, and watching videos of Ra, and getting, um, I had a couple of readings, uh, and I was kind of, um, you know, really uh, embedding myself inside of this system and, and coming to understand how it could influence my life. And the thing that that really um, caught my attention and really changed me was um, when I started to work with my strategy. Um, oh, looks like my Facebook Live has ended, so I'm not quite sure why that happened. <laughs> um, but we'll just stay on here and I will go ahead and post this on, on Facebook later. Okay, so the reason that I decided to train as a specialist and the, and the thing that really caught my attention with human design is actually relatively simple and it's something that you usually will learn first thing, which is that you learn your type and you learn your strategy. And when I first came across human design, um, gosh, it was probably about eight or nine years ago, and I learned that I was a generator, um, I pretty much dismissed it out of hand because I was like, what do you mean I'm designed to respond? I've been initiating my entire life. I'm an Aries son. I, I'm totally meant to make things happen. <laughs> like that was my, a, a lot of my self-concept. Um, but then after I had really kind of burned myself out again, which I have done multiple times in my life, uh, and I came across human design and I thought, well, you know what, maybe it would be worth it for me to pay a little bit more attention to this. And so I thought, okay, well, let's see, what does it even mean to respond? And I know for a lot of you, when you first come to uh, learn about your type and your strategy, uh, you know, 70% of us are designed to respond. Another 20% of us are designed to be invited. That's 90% of the population. That's most of us um, are not designed to make things happen in the traditional way that we have been trained. Um, and so we've really been um, uh, kind of led away from our design, if you will, um, by the way that we've been trained. We've mostly been trained to act like manifestors who are the only type that are designed to initiate. So I started practicing responding, and what I discovered was that there were a lot of things for me to respond to um, all the time. 
uh, I just hadn't really paid attention to them in that way. And I hadn't been um, being in a place of deep receptivity so that I could um, be receiving what was coming to me to respond to. So that one thing really started to change my life. And um, as I got deeper and deeper into human design, then I started taking more things seriously and acting on more of them. And it really illuminated for me some of the areas of my life that had been quite challenging. And I'm gonna to talk to you today about one of those areas, which is the gate 28, which I do have to find in my chart. Um, and so I'm gonna dive into that because I, it's been a big learning for me uh, through my life around the energy of that archetype. And I wanna share that with you. Um, but it, it, as I got deeper into human design, I realized I, I wanted to become a specialist. And that's when um, I had come across Karen and I had, uh, looked at some of the, the, I was on her email list and um, had read a number of the things that she did. And um, that's when I trained as a specialist. So I really want to um, uh, tip my hat to Karen. Um, and the reason I decided to train with her is, is that she, her kind of metaphysical and very positive attitude towards life and towards human design really matched my own um, more than um, Roz, which was a little more dark um, and I like to affectionately say curmudgeonly, <laughs> um, and uh, I, which I didn't really resonate with. I didn't resonate with the, that kind of curmudgeonly uh, interpretation, even though he's the founder, um, I, I, it kind of didn't sit, sit right with me. And as a generator, I didn't respond well to it. I was kind of like, uh-uh. But when I came across the way Karen talked about it, I was like, oh, uh-huh, uh-huh, this is, I am resonating with this. And so as I present to you today and in the series that follows, it is, um, it's really from that type of a perspective uh, where we see everything is mutable and that human design is presenting to us a, um, um, a map, if you will, of our evolution. Um, and that's part of its um, power with us, our, our evolution um, individually and our, our evolution um, collectively. And uh, so I want to speak to that piece um, uh, uh, today. Um, then before I go dive into, I just have a few slides that I want to show you, but before I dive into that, I want to give you a little more um, uh, foundation for how I really work with the chart, how I really see the chart. Um, and I'll just say that um, in addition to uh, receiving the trainings that I have from Karen, which are ongoing, uh, I also have brought my um, several decades <laughs> of work, um, both on my own inner, inner landscape um, and in those with um, clients and students, um, hundreds of clients and thousands of students at this point um, over the last um, 20, over 20, 25 years or so, really looking at how, what is our evolutionary path? Right? What are the things that are in the way of our personal freedom? And what are the ways that we can decondition ourselves, how we can unleash ourselves so that we can be more free to actually express who we are? This was what my work has always been about before I even came to human design. And so when I found human design, I felt like they, they really, you know, it was like hand in glove for me. Um, and, uh, and so I'm also bringing that perspective to how I think about human design. And one of the foundations of that is, is that everything is changeable, that it really is possible to change patterns that you have had your entire life, um, limiting patterns that you've had, ways of being, um, ways of seeing the world, ways of seeing yourself and relationships and work and so on. It really is possible to change those patterns. I have done it myself. I've helped many clients to do it. And so I always really like to affirm that because sometimes when people come to human design, they see that and some of the ways that it's taught is, is that it's really fixed, right? Ra used to wear a hat that said, no choice. <laughs> Karen's told that story before, like no choice, you're hardwired and this is the way that it is. I, I just really don't agree with that. I think that it is totally possible to continue to evolve who you are and to change patterns that you've had your whole life. And my purpose is to support you to become more and more authentically who you are, both in alignment with your design, but also in receiving what I call your soul signature, 
uh, wh the, which a big part of that is the wisdom that you've developed through your life experience. Because you are not your human design. You are not the map of your human design. Your human design gives you keys to aspects of who you are. But you, how you respond to your definition and how you respond to your openness um, is a big part of your life experience. And you have learned a lot of things that way. You've made different decisions along the way. Um, oftentimes when I do readings for people and I'll ask them, you know, how, how has this been for you? You know, this is in your chart. And they'll say, you know, I figured that out already. <laughs> when I was younger, I used to do this, but I figured out I really needed to shift and to do that. So without even knowing their design, that that, that can happen. But then there are other things oftentimes where it's like, wow, yeah, I'm really stuck inside of the energy of the lower expression of that particular part of my chart, right? And they're, and they're like, I don't know why I keep acting this way. I don't know why this keeps being a challenge for me. And that's where human design can be um, not more than affirming. It can be a guide to say, okay, well, then the higher expression of this is you know this other aspect of the archetype and here is a path that i am particularly good at providing for people because having been a coach and a mentor um you know most of my adult life um i'm, I'm good at helping people make that that transition if you will so that is really the foundation of how i look at human design and how i hold the chart and then it's also looking at when you look at the chart and we'll look at the chart in a minute is to say that you have access to and have experienced all of the energies of the chart, whether they're colored in or whether they're white. You have experienced all of them. Actually, let, let me just go ahead and bring up. Um, focused on the slide. Okay, there we go. All right. So yes, this is resiliency by design. Okay, let's take a look. Here's a um, picture of the chart. And um, uh, this is just a chart that I ran at a particular time back in February for a class I was doing. And so if we take a look at the chart, this is the mandala. I love the mandala because it is so um, beautiful and has so many um, different aspects to it. But usually we focus on this centerpiece here um, as being the body graph, okay? Um, sometimes you'll look at the whole mandala, uh, you know, uh, if you get it, particularly if you get a reading, um, I, I like to print these out for clients um, if they're interested in them. And that will, the, this will show the 64 hexagrams that go around the outside of the chart. Um, the numbers here are the, the numbers of the gate which relate to the 64 um, <clears throat> uh, uh, um, hexagrams of the I Ching. Inside of that, we'll see the astrological symbols and then we'll see where the planets are um, placed at the time of, uh, you know, for this one, it wasn't birth, it was just now at that particular date and then 88 days prior. So we talk about definition and openness. What's defined is what's colored in someone's chart, okay? And what's undefined or open are the parts that are white in the chart, okay? Now, sometimes when people look at their chart, they'll think, oh, I don't have those parts of the chart that are white. You absolutely do have those parts of the chart you just experience them differently than if they were colored in, okay? So it's not that you don't have them, it's just that you experience them differently. The colored parts of your chart, you have ongoing, ready, reliable access to the archetypal energies of, of those aspects of the chart, whether that's a gate, a channel, or a center. Um, the white as parts of the chart are the parts that we say are open, and those are energies that you experience being around other people who have them defined. So you've experienced those energies many, many different ways depending on who you're around. And your relationship to them are, is relatively fluid, meaning it can change depending on the circumstances. Now it is the case that sometimes you can get pretty heavily imprinted or conditioned in a place in your openness. Um, because of who you grew up around, usually particularly because that's who you've spent a lot of years with during an impressionable time of your life. 
Um, but not always. It could be um, from somebody you're living with now. It's like if you're married or if you've just been living with somebody for a long time, parents and children can condition each other. Um, you know, uh, your, your children can, can condition you also. So it, it depends. It's kind of like if you're really around somebody for a long time. But, um, but even so, you're going to have a relatively fluid relationship to that. Okay, let me just see if there's anything else I wanted to say about that. Um, so we are evolving uh, faster than ever, right? <laughs> We're evolving really, really fast. Um, and we need to be evolving faster because the challenges that are going on in our world are really calling us to be smarter and calling us to be more creative um, and calling us to uh, be able to evolve into a larger perspective where we can take our, you know, everyone on our planet and all of um, our companion species and our earth itself into account as we are uh, developing the world that we want to be living in. And um, resiliency, in my view, is a key aspect of um, what we can learn from the human desire and what we can practice. Now, I just want to make a side note here. For those of you who know Karen's work, she has nine resiliency keys that she's developed out of human design. Um, what I'm talking about is not her resiliency keys. This is something different that is coming out of my understanding um, of human design. And what she's done is brilliant. It's just very different. Um, and so in the every every single aspect of the chart, um, uh, let's just go back here. Um, every part of the uh, 64 hexagrams, the uh, 36 channels, and the nine centers, all of those have uh, what we commonly, traditionally call a higher or a lower expression. Ra used to call the the, uh, the 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 not self was the lower expression, right? Particularly in the um, open areas of your chart. Um, but if we just think about these as archetypal energies that you know have like shadow, right, and then higher expression, um, or you, I like to think of it as a more um, empowering, more uplifting. Uh, more uh, full of possibility and potential way of experiencing the archetypes as opposed to uh, a way that's more contracting, sometimes more fear-based, um, sometimes more um, uh, uh, just negative and, and, and um, whether that's negative against self or negative against others. Um, you know, there's, there's different ways of, of thinking about that. But I, you know, if you even think of it as one, I, I don't really like the polarities because even when I say more expansive or more contractive, because things that are contracted have their place and are, are also beneficial. Um, and shadow in, in itself also has its place. Um, but it is about being able to evolve into a, an expression that is more empowering and more uplifting for you and enabling you to um, create your life the way that you truly want it to and to contribute in the way that is best for you. And that, I think, is a, is a component of resiliency, right? Is the ability to um, meet a challenge and find the, the more empowering and more uplifting way um, of responding to it. So let's dive into the channel that we're gonna talk, I was gonna talk about today. So um, this is the channel, I'm uh, sorry, the um, gate 28. It's um, um, lit up down here at the bottom of the chart, okay? And it is part of the spleen center. Okay, and the spleen is uh, the, the center for instinct and intuition, um, the immune system and timing. And so the, the spleen traditionally has been known as like the center for intuition. But the intuition that's in the spleen is more um, an instinctual uh, intuition. Okay, and it's also a, the place where fear lives in the chart. The, the gates on the spleen are known as fear gates. So the 28 is known as a fear gate, just as all of the other gates are. Now, the thing is, is that the fear of, uh, of the gates in the spleen and of the spleen are instinctual. And if we think about this for a minute, most, for the most part, our instinctual fears are not particularly relevant 
um, in our modern society, in our, our, you know, in the West, in a more highly technological society. Um, we, we, we certainly, we don't have predators um, that we're dealing with. Um, uh, not everyone, but a lot of people have enough to eat. Um, and uh, not everyone, but a lot of us have a place to live, right? And this is kind of more the norm in um, the Western countries. Uh, and hopefully it will become more and more the norm so that everyone has enough food and everyone has a, has a place to live. Um, but for, for those of us who do have those kind of fundamental uh, issues of survival handled, the instinctual fears are not really relevant, but they can still rear up for us. So the gate 28 is traditionally known as the gate of struggle. Okay. And it is half of what's known as the, as the channel of struggle when it is connected down here to the 38. Um, it, it's known as the channel of struggle. And so for um, the, the 28, it's, it's fear um, is, is partly that life is, is really hard, um, that life is always difficult. Um, it, this can lead to a kind of victim consciousness it can lead us to a, you know, why do things always turn out the way for me? Um, everything is so challenging. Um, things always fall apart. Um, my, uh, you know, my work is dissatisfying or I get fired from jobs or my relationships don't work out or my partner is mean to me or my partner cheats on me, right? This is where that kind of thinking um, lives is, is in the 28. Now, the thing is, is that that is the low expression of the gate 28, um, the, that it, the victim consciousness, right? Which is to see that oneself as being simply at the mercy of what's going on around you in the world and not having the ability to be a co-creator uh, with spirit of your life, right? And so you can flip this around to see this, first of all, as... Um, a, a, an energy that can meet challenges, right? Rather than seeing this as struggle, we can see it as a challenge. As soon as we can move from struggle into challenge, we can mitigate a lot of the suffering that we have. Um, and I can imagine that there are people right now who in the midst of what's happening with COVID-19 are experiencing aspects of their life as a struggle. They could be feeling like they're a victim, like they've gotten, you know, they've lost their job or they're sheltering in place um, or um, they even have gotten sick or a friend of theirs or has died, you know. Um, and so we, this can stimulate this kind of victim consciousness inside of us when things big like this happen. And so if we can shift that to see this as a challenge, like, okay, so here we have a challenge and what am I going to do with this? Like, what am I going to do with this time? Am I going to now learn how to telecommute, right? How do I start to work from home? Lots and lots of people have learned how to work from home where they didn't used to do that. They used to go into an office or they used to go into um, some, some way that, that, that they went to work or restaurants that have had to meet this as a challenge. And so they're now doing takeout orders, right? They've had to do a pivot so that they could um, start doing um, uh, uh, takeout rather than having people come in. There's lots of people who are starting to bring their businesses online now uh, who had them that were more in person. And, then, and now they're starting to see clients or to teach classes online. There's lots of ways we can turn this around into a challenge as opposed to really seeing ourselves um, as a victim. Now, if you can even more see this as an opportunity, um, it, probably you have heard of this idea uh, the, the Chinese hexagram for challenge and opportunity is the same, right? So challenge, opportunity. And I was just saying, how do we meet these challenges as opportunities? I know inside of my dance community, you know, we have started dancing a lot through Zoom online with each other. And it's totally not the same as being in person, absolutely. But it's pretty darn great. And the more that we can just focus on this as being something positive rather than focusing on what we're not getting on a negative, 
we can actually even take the opportunity into the realm of adventure. So if we take something that's challenging for us and we go, wow, you know, all right, what can we do with this, right? What can arise from this? Um, that's even more exciting, right? And so how do we take this and, and turn the, this into a, um, an adventure? So if we take a look at <clears throat> this um, next slide, we can see that um, I, I, here I've lit up the emotional solar plexus and also the G center. Now, the reason I did this is, is that in the story of human design, we are moving from the focus on the spleen as the center of, of um, intuition and creation into the emotional solar plexus. And this has to do with the, um, with the big transition that's going on right now. Um, and what I want to um, just uh, invite you into is to see that the, the emotional solar plexus is really a creative center. Okay. And you create with your emotional energy, you create with what you get emotionally involved in what you're thinking about it, how it feels in your body. So the more that you are able to stimulate positive emotions inside of you that come, that turn your, you know, in, they come from inspiration, um, that, that, in, that turn inspiration into aspirations that um, live in the realm of possibility and potentials. What happens is, is you then calibrate the magnetic monopole that lives in the, in the G center. You don't have to know what that is. Just follow me, me for a minute here. But it'll calibrate the attractive force that you have in your heart. And so then you'll bring more things into your outer reality that you will get to respond to if you are a generator or a manifesting generator or even invitations if you're a projector. And it'll also, it's also a way for you as a manifester um, to have the stimulus that comes up inside of you about what to initiate. And it can also help the reflector to know um, oh, this is, this is really what I'm feeling into, and this is what I'm wanting to call into my life. So we can take the potential fear and struggle of the 28, and we can turn it around to challenge opportunity and even into adventure, and make it um, an, an, an archetype that we can um, utilize. Like if you, if you imagine, um, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember the name of that film, um, it was about these women who um, sailed around, uh, I don't know if it was around the world, um, but it was a big, a big circumference of the earth and a yacht. Um, and it was, you know, women had never done this before, right? And all the men thought that they couldn't do it. And there is this, um, there was a film that was made about them. Um, it was, it's a phenomenal film. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of it. But they totally turned that, um, situation which could have been absolutely filled with struggle, <laughs> you know, into an adventure, right? They were just like, okay, we're going to do this. They actually took um, took the route that went around the um, uh, went down the South Pole, um, down the the. Um, oh, I'm sorry, my my nouns are not coming to me today, but it was around the the bottom of um, Chile. Um, and Argentina, they, they actually took that down to the South Pole and where it was super cold um, because it was faster. And that they actually won for that period. They went the fastest in, uh, among that segment of the race, right? So they completely took on this energy of the 28 and said, okay, we're gonna turn this um, struggle into, um, uh, into an adventure. I saw that some of you posted in the chat and I'm going to be over there and respond. So if you have questions or, um, or ahas or anything, st start putting those in there and I'll be, because um, I'm almost done with what I wanted to present. Okay, so some suggestions for you in how you can make that transition from if you're feeling like really challenged or you're feeling like you're struggling with something or like you're at the mercy of forces in the world that are bigger than you are, to call on your creativity, um, to activate your imagination, to step into possibility and to use all of those to be um, uh, 
coming up for you with yourself, imagining, wow, what are all the different ways that this could um, shift for me? What are all the different, even crazy possibilities of what could happen? Um, I love the, uh, uh, this idea of the 10 what if, which I got from a book called um, The Architecture of All Abundance um, by Lenidra uh, Jewell that I got at one point um, that I just, oh no, Lenidra Carroll, um, that the 10 what ifs, which is you, you take a challenging situation and you just spin out, you know, what if, right? And they can be as crazy as, you know, you want. Like you could say, okay, we're in the midst of COVID-19. What if, you know, finally the, um, you know, the angels decide to come and land um, and help us and, and lead us into a, a, a truly higher um, consciousness um, where we can uh, spontaneously heal ourselves from all uh, contagion. <laughs> Right. That's part that that is a that is a, a wild and crazy what if. But when you allow yourself to actually do something like that, you might be surprised about something that's a little more uh, connected to your your daily life can come through and then to start generating the emotion of positive anticipation. Oh, well, it could be like this. It could be like that. Ooh, what would that feel like for it to be this way or that way? When you do this, you start to create possible futures for yourself, possible futures. You're starting to send your creative power out into um, your imagining of what your, how your life can unfold. And it's a very potent thing for you to do with your visionary power. And then when you get in, in, um, involved with it, uh, with positive anticipation, that's where you help to, to calibrate that magnetic force in the center of your heart and have different things come to you. All right. Very good. That is what I wanted to share with you. Let's see here. Let me just stop this part. All right. Okay. Um, yay. Let's see here. All right. Um, okay, Shan. So Shan is asking, I'm missing some background here. Who created human design this chart? And so that is beyond the scope of what I'm going to cover in any depth today, but I will just make a comment about it. Um, of course, I understand the words. Um, okay. Oh, she's leaving now. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so I think what I'll do is, um, in relation to what Shan is saying, um, I may do some, uh, just basic teaching about human design so that you can have some context for what to, um, for what it is that, that I'm talking about. Okay. So Beatrice asks, um, are those who have the gate active more likely to live in the lower vibrations than the higher ones? Does an active gate mean defined by, by comparison with centers? Does the fact that it's conscious or unconscious active gate make a difference? Okay. Um, I don't ever, so Beatrice, I don't ever use the term active. Okay. Um, all gates are active. It's in my way of thinking about it. It's defined. Okay, it's defined or undefined or open. So you don't have a gate that's not active, in my view. Um, it may be that you, because you all, you have the whole chart. And even though you're not around someone who has like the 20, like if you have the 28 and it's open in your chart, it's white, um, you're gonna have residue of how you've experienced that, that gate from other people. Okay, you're never, you're not going to be completely free of your experience of that gate. Okay, so I'm just want to say that. So, um, so you're saying, do people who have it defined, I'm just going to translate this, do people have it defined more likely to live in the lower vibrations rather than the higher ones? No, not at all. Mm -mm, not at all. Um, the only thing that definition gives you is it means that you have ongoing, ready, reliable, consistent, relatively fixed access to that energy, okay? So, whereas if you have it open, it's more fluid. Um, and you may not have access to that energy all the time, although you will have some, like you said, some residue, particularly the older that you get. <laughs> um, 
And so anyone can be relating to the lower or the higher vibrations of any aspect of the chart. This is what our evolutionary path is all about, or you know, our soul path is about being able to identify with and embody the higher expressions of all of the aspects of the chart. That is in fact what our what our journey is about. And for some of us, you know, in your own chart, um, it, it's the places that are major themes for you um, that are gonna really show you where you wanna focus. Like for me, the 28 has been a big focus and, and that whole channel because the 38 is the, is the energy of knowing what's worth fighting for. Um, it's often called the Martin Luther King gate, right? It's like, you know, do, what do you have enough courage and fortitude and chutzpah to fight for, right? And you can imagine that you could experience that as struggle or you could imagine that as, as being a challenge that can become an opportunity and even an adventure. And that trajectory for me, having it defined, has been a, a journey for me and I have learned to switch it more and more as I have gotten older. If I had it open, it would be easier for me to do that because it's more fluid. I would have more choice. It would be easier for me to do that. So um, that's really the main distinction. Um, but because you have it, um, have it consistent, even fixed, sometimes it's hard to change the way that you're relating to a particular archetype in the chart um, because you've always kind of experienced it this way. Like somebody who's really, who's got the gate 28 defined and has always seen themselves as a victim it'll take more energy for them to shift over in, into seeing it more as an opportunity um, and an adventure because it is relatively fixed for them, but it's not immutable. Like I said at the beginning, my view, my experience is that it really is possible to change any pattern that you've had your entire life, including victim consciousness. Okay, um, let's see. Does an active gate mean defined um, by comparison with centers? I don't know what the last part. Um, does an active gate mean defined? I think so. I think wherever you've heard active, I would call that defined. I don't know what that means by comparison with centers. Can you clarify that for me, Beatrice? Because I don't know what that part means. Does the fact that it's conscious or unconscious um, gate make a difference? It does. It does, and there's also, here Lisa's asking about um, if the gate is red and black. Okay, so if it's red, it, it means that it's in um, what sometimes is called unconscious or design. If it's black, um, it's conscious or personality. Um, it's kind of a deep conversation, but what I would say here is that the things that are in the black are the ones that you're gonna be more aware of working with. Okay, and the ones that are in the red, like you might think, are a little more unconscious. They, they're a little bit just more a part of who you are, and you may not be as um, aware of them, but because they're so embedded in your experience of who you are. Um, Karen says, and I'm not quite sure what I think about this, but she says that your um, epigenetics live in the unconscious part of your chart, or the design part of your chart. Um, which I find interesting, right? Because your epigenes are what affect your gene expression, whether or not a gene is turned on or off, right? And we inherited that from 14 generations. So that's kind of interesting, right? Whereas the black are what we're more aware of as kind of themes that we're working with in life. But we are working with themes of the red also. And when you make them more conscious, then it's easier to understand. Now, for you, Lisa, if you've got it red and black, that means that the 28 is showing up um, twice in your chart. Um, and it could be one planet, often Saturn or Pluto, um, is both in the 28, both in both the design and the personality, um, or different planets are showing up. Often in the 28 or Pluto because they, I mean, sorry, Saturn or Pluto because they move slowly. So it's not unusual to see those in the same uh, gate, 88 days um, apart. Okay. Okay, so Beatrice, you says your mind is defined conscious earth. So that means it's a big theme for you because um, your earth is what grounds you. Okay, so you learning to make this transition to really see this as an adventure 
is going to is going to enhance your life significantly and enable you to really be able to um, grasp a hold of and express the energy of your son, your conscious son, um, better. Okay. Um, if gate 28 is undefined in my chart and gate 38 is defined in my chart, would I have gate 28 awareness come up in my chart if I encountered a person? Um, I'm not quite sure I know what you mean by awareness, um, Carolyn, but I think what you mean is that here's the thing. When you have a hanging gate, so you're saying you have a hanging gate, you have the 38, but you don't have the 28. So that's known as a hanging gate because it doesn't have its mate, right? So its mate, its electromagnetic mate is the 28. Now, the thing is, is when you have a hanging gate like that, that 38 is always going to be looking for a 28. Okay, it's always going to be like, dee, 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 where's the 28? Where's the 28? Because it wants to complete that channel. And that's true for any of your hanging gates. And so sometimes it's actually not unusual for you to feel the energy of the mate of your hanging gate more than the energy of the gate you have defined. See, this is where the, the thing about openness is really interesting because the, it, as that 38 is always looking for a 28, right? It's going to hook up to the 28 in somebody else. And then you're going to, yes, Carolyn, you're going to experience that 28 because that 38 is always looking for that. And in some ways, you may even be more aware of it because it's like, oh, there's that 28. I take it in and I amplify it. I take it in and I amplify it, right? Which is what we do with our openness. So, um, yeah, so you will feel it and you may even be more aware of it than you are of the 38. Um, okay, similar to define, not defined. Okay. Thanks, Maxine. Um, what does this mean practically? Um, I don't, Lisa, what are you referring to when you say, what does this mean? I need you to, can you restate it with what you mean? Uh, what, um, what you're referring to that your referent is not there. Okay. Oh, regarding when you have a black and red, um, both in the gates. Um, you know, honestly, I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> I, I just wouldn't, you know, that's a question for a full reading, Lisa. I just, the thing is, is it's a major theme in your life. That's all you really need to know. Um, Deborah, I might have missed this as my audio cut out for a bit, but if my 28 channel is white, what does that mean? It means that you have it open. You're a manifester. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Um, if it's open, if it's white, it means it's open. And if it's open, kind of, um, it, it means that you are going to experience that energy many different ways, depending on who you're around. And so when you connect with somebody who has it defined, like me, like I have it defined, so you might be feeling it more right now because you're picking it up from me. And so how you're gonna experience it, like because I have really worked on my 28, right? And, uh, and like in a very active practice of having my 28 be in as much in the area of adventure as possible, you're going to experience the 28 as an energy of um, possibility, adventure, opportunity, and so on. Whereas if you come around someone else who has the 28 and they're stuck in victim consciousness, you're going to pick up their victim consciousness and you're going to feel that and amplify that instead. And that's why you can feel really differently when you're around different people. Now, through the course of your life, you're going to, so you're going to experience that 28 many, many different ways, depending on who you're around. And over time, you get to have some choice about that, right? So you get to be like, wow, okay, am I going to be steeped in victim consciousness when a challenge comes up in my life? Or do I get to go, wow, how do I turn this into an opportunity? How do I turn it into adventure? right? So that is your opportunity. And because it's not defined in you, it's more fluid. You have a bit more um, control over, it's easier for you to, to switch the way that you're inhabiting it. Um, and the thing is, is you may not consistently be able to hold on to any particular expression of the 28 because you don't have it defined. So it'll come and go. Whereas somebody who has it defined is it's going to be more fixed. It's going to be more consistent and more fixed. Okay. 
Um, right, Deborah. So your 28 is a gate, just so you know, it's a gate, it's not a channel. Okay, it's a gate. Um, and your 38 is um, open, is white, so it's open. So that means that, yeah, your 28 is always gonna be looking for a 38 in other people. Just like I said with Carolyn, where her 28, um, or her 38 is looking for a 28. Well, your, your 28 is going to be looking for a 38. And so you may even be more aware of the energy of the 38, which is that Martin Luther King gate, which is the fight, you know, finding what is worth fighting for. Like, what is it that you really want to be able to find putting all of your energy into so that you can make the contribution you came here to work, um, to make. Okay. Um, Oh, thank you, Deborah. That's very kind of you. Um, how did I work on it? Um, let me hold on a, bit, a second, Beatrice. Let me just see here. Oh, okay, I see this over here. How did I work on it? Um, let me just kind of collect my thoughts for a moment about that. Um, I mean, it's been an evolution and I grew up in an African-American neighborhood and I was exposed to Martin Luther King very early in my life. And I was very imprinted by that. And I also, my parents were involved in civil rights. Um, I grew up kind of on the tail end of civil rights and um, came of age during feminism. And so the whole notion of struggle and needing to struggle in order to create change, Frederick Douglass famously said, without struggle, there is no change. Um, and so I, I grew up watching that and um, later participating as I came of age. Um, and what I really loved both about civil rights and about feminism is that it was about moving out of victim consciousness, um, consciousness raising. It's what you know, typically we called uh, work in feminism at the time. And it was in our, you know, it was really learning to be able to say, wow, how have we been colonized by patriarchy? How have we agreed to be a part of this? And inside of civil rights, you know, it was like, how have we, um, I think it's a little bit different, it wasn't so much agreed to be segregated and thrown into slavery and so on, but it was about how, how can we open our minds to our own power, right? And that was one of the things Martin Luther King was really about, was how do we realize our own our own internal power and then how do we express it, right? Which is of course what civil rights was all about. So that process was something that I was really early exposed to. And um, my academic work was about uh, slave revolts on ships. <laughs> um, that was my, my dissertation in my book. Um, Cause I was always interested in how do people create more personal freedom from themselves in dire circumstances. And then I came into metaphysics and in metaphysics, I was introduced to the idea that you create your reality with your thoughts. Um, and I have modified that a lot over the years so that now I think we co-create with spirit based on what we become emotionally involved in. And when we realize that we're acting like we have no authority and no power in our lives, then that's what we're gonna experience. And we can actually decide to make a change and go, well, okay, what do I have some command over? What change can I make in my life? How can I change my attitude? I mean, Viktor Frankl is the classic um, example of this, right? Um, Viktor Frankl, who you know, lived in the concentration camps and who um, made a decision that his consciousness and what he was able to think and feel um, no one could control. Um, and so it, it was that, you know, it was that the com coming to, to really see that and go, okay, how does this apply to my life? 
like right now today, how can I create more freedom for myself? How can I um, be more creative for myself? You know, how can I roll with the things that I cannot change, right? The serenity prayer, right? That, that's in AA is a great example of that, right? You know, how do I accept the things that I can't change, you know, and the courage to change the things that I can? not um, I think that that is a great, you know, gate 28 <laughs> statement, right? It's like, um, and there was a, um, uh, uh, a psychologist, a, psych a psychologist who put out a thing on Facebook um, recently. It had 13 different points of what, what you can do during this pandemic to, you know, to kind of um, feel better, basically. And one of them was find something that you can control and control the hell out of it. <laughs> because so much is out of your control right now. So what I did was I was like, okay, you know what? I really wanted to get this book proposal done. And I'm, I am I, you know, and getting my book proposal done because I can control the hell out of that. So I would say find something that you can't, you know, also realizing that control really is an illusion, but, but, um, you know, doing what you can to work with what is in, is in your purview to be able to work with. Okay. Um, oh, that's great, Beatrice. All right, dear ones, I think that we're going to wrap up for today. Thank you so much for your questions. I really appreciate that. I will be back here next week. I don't know what um, I'm going to focus on, but it'll be about resiliency again. Um, I'm going to do a series on resiliency because I think this is kind of what we need right now. <laughs> and it's helpful for me also. So um, I plan to post this uh, on the um, inside of the Sovereignty by Design um, Facebook group, which if you haven't gotten, um, uh, if you're not in there, um, I would encourage you to come in and be a part of it. So we'll have some of the uh, conversation going on over there. All right, many blessings, much love. Bye for now. Thanks everybody. <laughs>